So I have water and coffee. <laughs> I'm not sure which one I'll, I'll, I'll uh, get to first. Um, but I, I want to begin by, by thanking the University of Oregon for inviting me to, uh, to give this, uh, this talk uh, tonight. Uh, uh, I especially want to uh, thank Bernard Strickland, in whose honor this lecture is, uh, is designed. As was already said, and I won't repeat uh, what you said, but, but it is useful to underline uh, just what uh, a pioneer uh, Bernard was. Uh, although he, I, I'm not much younger than Bernard, in fact, maybe just a couple of years, uh, uh, but I continue to look to Bernard as a model, uh, and I continue to look to him for the kind of leadership that is essential uh, in uh, education and in the discipline of, of Indian law. He's a remarkable citizen in the institutions of legal education. And I think uh, it's important to, to underline that because uh, in a time when uh, what I, ethical leadership is rare, uh, it is, uh, it's, it's good to have exemplars that we can refer to uh, now and again uh, to hold as a, a, a lodestar. As a scholar, he was scrupulous, honest, and I think most important, courageous. <coughs> Courage is not a, a trait that is typically associated with, with uh, scholarship. But I think uh, in the areas in which we write, uh, courage is an important ingredient. Because often we'll write things, and I know Renard has written things, that uh, go against the grain, cause people in, in, in the conventional uh, uh, parts of, uh, of the academy to uh, look askance at. Until the time that its power is revealed and they can no longer look askance, but have to adopt it as the mainstream. So uh, it takes courage to stand against the tide. And, and Bernard has done that and has given me courage uh, to do it uh, again and again. Sometimes perhaps he would say foolhardily, uh, but, but nonetheless, he's an example. And I want to thank you for that, Bernard. I think a little bit of the courage uh, that uh, Renard is an exemplar of, uh, we witnessed or I witnessed today outside the federal courthouse in, uh, here in Eugene. As the, uh, the Supreme Court is considering uh, extending the stay that was issued last week, uh, a group of students and their supporters were standing out there not making wishes, but stand out there to hold uh, accountable the people that uh, need to be held accountable that form the, the genesis of the lawsuit that they filed. It's a lawsuit that's echoed around the world, not just in the claims that it makes, but in the claims that others are making in courts uh, around the world. It gave the students a chance, and I think when you think about the role that education plays, it gave the students a chance to test just uh, what a democratic government owes to its people and what the constitutional meaning of a right to life, a liberty, and property is in the era of climate change. That's uh, what the lawsuit's about. That's what the students were uh, standing in the rain uh, talking about. And I reflected, actually, because uh, my daughter is applying for a job. And one of the questions that she got on her application, it, it, I, and I recall this uh, after I got back to the hotel after the, the, the uh, demonstration. And the question on her application was, is it more important that we move to a zero carbon society as fast as possible or as justly as possible? 
Choose one and briefly explain your answer. And so this was her answer. Reflecting on the claim made by Pope Francis and Laudato Si, that environmental improvements are inextricably linked to social justice, I find this a difficult choice to make, if not a false one. If compelled to choose, I would have to choose the rapid reduction in greenhouse gases so that we might achieve the conditions from which justice might be constructed. I think the answer she gave, while simple, uh, is, is also profound. Because what it recognizes, and what the students out there were recognizing, and what the, the case that I'm going to talk about today recognizes, is that rights don't exist in the abstract. Rights are constructed out of the material conditions that permit them to be exercised. And without the material conditions that permit them to be exercised, it, it makes no sense to talk about rights at all. Just like culture has to have material conditions under which it can be reconstructed, reproduced, that to talk about a right to culture or rights at all without focusing on the material conditions that permit those rights to be exercised or made real in the world is just another way to say it. it means you're not serious. You're not talking about rights at all. You're talking about something that sounds good, something that may be mellifluous, something that uh, may make you feel better, but you're not talking about what real rights are. And so uh, I think that's what the children were doing outside of the courthouse today. That's what the, the scholarship of Renard has always focused on. Uh, that's where he has directed me in my work, and I think that's what the case uh, uh, in the most recent case in the generations long litigation over the Stevens treaties are also about. Right? They're not about rights in the abstract. They're about rights that have a material component, something that enables them to, to be real. After the initial contact, the most dogged enemies of tribal sovereignty have been the states. Although most of the states were carved out of tribal land, most of the states still claim a, a superior right to the resources, despite the accommodations to non-Indians made in the various treaties. The treaties themselves often predate the creation of the states. Yet that temporal disjunction does nothing to, to quiet the piteous mewling of states when they feel their interests are being trenched upon by tribal interests. Despite the tribes having ceded the great bulk of their land to non-Indians, I feel like it's uh, important, as Rebecca Solnit says, to call things by their true names. And what she says is, and it, she just says it plainly, right, the American West was indigenous land given to the settlers by the United States government and cleared out for them by the United States Army, crisscrossed by government railroads, government subsidized railroads, and government subsidized water projects. So that while treaties have always been a source of judicial controversy, they nonetheless represent a political settlement between uh, sovereigns and the backdrop against which claims by states should be assessed. Moreover, treaty rights claimed by tribes are not only, per the Constitution, the supreme law of the land. They're protected from depredation 
by the property rights guaranteed by the Constitution, and they may not be limited except through the express and unambiguous language of congressional statute. So while conflicts over resource use have been uh, common, and in fact the basic engine of westward expansion has been uh, that displaced native people from their land, uh, abuse of treaty guarantees has also been common. The vast territories that the tribes had were reduced on a number of occasions, first through the creation of reservations, then through the uh, allotment acts. But many of these treaties uh, guaranteed or reserved to the tribes the right to hunt and fish in off-reservation locations. The treaty rights often took the form of uh, essentially warranted easements across public and private land. Yet non-Indians resisted tribal efforts to exercise these rights, sometimes violently, as I'm, those of you who studied the history of the Pacific Northwest uh, fishing wars understand, but more commonly by efforts to expand state jurisdiction. Right. State jurisdiction is a way in which treaty and Indian rights are reduced. Uh, it may not appear as violent as showing up with a gun, right? but it has the net effect of reducing, materially reducing the power of the tribes to exercise claims that were guaranteed to them and negotiated by them in the, the treaties. So in the Stevens Treaties, the treaties at stake in the Washington case, the, uh, the tribe ceded about 64 million acres of land to, uh, to the United States and reserved through the fishing clause the right to take fish at all the usual and accustomed stations in common with all citizens of the territory. The usual and accustomed grounds and stations included off-reservation sites that were customarily, customarily used by tribes. Over a hundred years of litigation has uh, uh, attempted to spell out uh, just what the, uh, the uh, treaties meant, the precise scope of it. Uh, it has uh, often been, and here I'll just summarize, has often been the attempt of the states to expand their regulatory reach over the use of uh, uh, fishing sites or to regulate the way in which tribes uh, uh, collected the fish that they collected or uh, attempts to regulate the amount of fish that the tribes got. And these fights went back and forth. The tribes finally, under the Supreme Court uh, rulings, were guaranteed a right to share the uh, take in common and to share equally, not just the fish in the streams, but hatchery raised fish, and uh, to be able to get enough fish to maintain a moderate living. The current case has been what other obligations the treaties produce. What the tribe has maintained, and uh, if we, I want you to think back to the, the first part of my lecture, which uh, you know I could have been using just to fill dead air, but I actually wasn't. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, which is which is that you that there are material conditions, right, that that have to be protected, that are essential to the rights that are claimed. And so, while the uh, uh, Attorney General Office of the State of Washington 
has accused the, the tribes of trying to concoct a, a portable environmental claim uh, in complaining about the uh, role of the culverts in blocking uh, fish, fish passage. The tribes actually were doing nothing of the kind. The tribes were essentially making the argument that the state has an obligation not to obstruct the rights of the tribes to take fish that were guaranteed to them. And part of that right necessarily contains the obligation to maintain, to the extent possible, the capacity of the fish themselves to reproduce. Anatomous fish have to migrate. If they can't get from the salt water to the fresh water, they don't reproduce. If they don't reproduce, then the, there are no fish uh, to take. The, the state, though, had a good argument. The state said, wait a minute. The federal government can't sue us over the culverts. They can't sue us to open the culverts because you, federal government, when you gave us money to build the roads, you also gave us money to build the culverts. And we built the culverts consistent with federal specifications. So if we built the culverts to federal, uh, federal specifications, you being subsidized by the federal government, the federal government can't now come and sue us for the insufficiency of those culverts to permit water uh, uh, to flow in uh, large enough amounts to enable the, the fish to, to migrate. It's, it's not a bad argument, is it? <laughs> the argument is like, sounds, they're saying, look, you know, you're, you're giving with one hand and taking away with the other. Well, the federal government said, yes, we did do that. We did do that. But what we didn't do with that was to remove your obligation the obligation that arose under the treaty. So that the culverts that are now found to be obstructing fish migration have to be changed in order to permit the fish migration, even if you did construct it under a federal grant permitting you to uh, build roads. That is, we did not give you a license when we permitted you to build roads and provided some of the subsidy to build those roads. We did not also give you a license to violate the treaty obligations, which you knew were pre-existing. So the treaty obligations pre-existed the roads, they pre-existed the culverts, they pre-existed the federal government. And I hesitate to say this because it's a... It's, it's, I was going to say it's not really fair, but I'm, it may be, it's mainly fair. Uh, uh, I'm not going to say it's uniformly fair. It's, it's mainly fair. Uh, that that uh, uh, requiring tribes to depend on the federal government to protect their interests is not always a safe bet. <laughs> right? It's not always a safe bet. Uh, and so, the idea that, that the, the process for road building was an exemption from the treaty rights, actually, uh, uh, I think the court had very little time with, with that argument. Although, I would have to say, facially, it seems to be a, a, a good argument. But what it does do, what it does do, right, is it causes the state of Washington to start to have to uh, reconstruct the culverts that are obstructing the fish. There, the state had another defense, of course. The state had a defense that, that, that federal culverts were also uh, obstructing fish uh, um, migration. Also not a bad argument. Although, uh, I don't know how many of you have brothers and sisters, <laughs> right? But some of you have brothers and sisters, I imagine, right? And she did it first, <laughs> right? No parent almost, no parent, 
ever accepts that <laughs> as an excuse for you having done something, right? right? Or they did it too, right? Which is, uh, perhaps I'm caricaturing the state's argument, right? But it's effectively the same argument, right? That is, the federal government did it, and, they're, and, and you're, you're not uh, uh, cleaning out your culverts. We did it under federal guidance. Now we have to clean out our, our culverts. And the answer is, we are representing the, the tribes as the trustee. And as the trustee, we can instruct you, someone who is violating the trust duty, to act in a way which we may ultimately have to act consistent with that duty. But it does not in the uh, present absolve you of your obligations to meet your treaty, uh, your treaty duties. And so put aside the fact that the federal culverts are upstream from where your culverts are anyway, which of course is uh, one of those kind of uh, uh, inconvenient facts, <laughs> right? An inconvenient fact. But the, the state then had to make the culverts accessible so that they might uh, not um, impede the, uh, the fish from going upstream. The more important part of the case, though, is not just whether it requires the uh, states to maintain their culverts in a way that permits the uh, fish to migrate. The more important part is whether the obligation, that is the obligation to maintain the culverts in a way that uh, uh, permitted the, uh, the salmon to migrate and to reproduce, is whether the state has a duty not to interfere with the fish by insufficiently maintaining its various environmental obligations. So that what the court did say is that whether there is a specific environmental obligation on the state that arises consistent with their obligations under the treaty can only be articulated once there are specific facts that are argued. The culverts, of course, presented one set of facts within which you could test the question of whether there's a, an environmental duty that is incumbent on the state consistent with the obligations arising out of the treaty. So rather than being some kind of convenient, portable environmental claim, it is a claim that is goes to the, to, to the heart of what the, the treaty duty is, which is there are material conditions that have to be maintained in order to give life, vitality, reality to the treaty itself. The fact that those are not articulated in advance with specificity doesn't mean that those rights aren't there. It's true for all of us, and I want to put it in a different context. Where do human rights come from? Well, you could say, well, they come from treaties. Right? You can write a treaty, and you can identify a human right within that treaty. Or you can look to the Constitution and say, well, we've got enumerated rights in the Constitution, but that's exactly the wrong way to look at it. It's not just kind of wrong, but it's exactly wrong. <laughs> it's exactly wrong. And let me tell you why. Because I want to talk about the Constitution, I want to bring it back to treaties. And I want to bring it back to this idea that there's an environmental right that arises under the treaty obligations. What's the genius of the American Constitution? Well, you could say it's the uh, dividing the government up into the three departments and making sure that the three departments then regulate each other. And we know that's one of the geniuses of, of the Constitution. 
But the real genius of the Constitution, the thing that made the Constitution revolutionary when it was adopted, was that it took the idea of legitimacy that grounded the power of the princes and the kings of Europe and turned it inside out. In Europe, you had <clears throat> kings and princes with unlimited power, and you had subjects with limited rights. What the Constitution said is instead what we have is a government of limited powers and a people with unlimited rights. We have the Bill of Rights, but then we have the Ninth Amendment. What does the Ninth Amendment say? Well, it's convenient, right? If you remember, it's convenient if you don't remember, depending on what, side you, what argument you want to make, right? But what it says is that those rights not enumerated are reserved to the people. So the question that arises, how do you decide which rights emerge? What's the technique, what's the mechanism from which you determine which rights are the rights that are defensible and maintainable in a juridical proceeding? Right? You don't have to go to natural rights to find human rights. Right? You don't have to go to natural rights to find the rights that emerge from the Ninth Amendment to which we are all heirs. What you have to do is you have to say what kinds of rights was the Constitution designed to protect through its basic structure and the relationship of its parts one to the other. How did it disperse power? How did it reserve power to the people in order to protect those claims, which might be articulated as rights? Some of them, like the right to marry. That's, that's, I think you, you can search the Constitution top to bottom. Not find those words anywhere in the Constitution. So where did that right come from? The right to marry someone of your choice. Where did that right come from? They find it under a rock, <laughs> right? Is it if you if you read the the Constitution backwards, does it suddenly emerge like you know Paul is dead? Uh, no, no, it it emerges out of the things from which freedom as citizens, not subjects, emerge. So let's go back to treaties. And let's go back to treaties and talk about treaties in the context of environmental claims, right? Rather than being something made up from which the tribes can assert power against the states, right? And you know, the tribes are orthogonal in the, in the, in the federal construction anyway. Right? No, what the treaties create in, in the fishing clause is a right that is guaranteed to the tribes to fish at their normal and customary places and actually catch fish. Actually catch fish, right? They're not, they don't get to just hike down to the creek right, and observe it. They get to catch fish. So what's the state's obligation? The state's obligation is to not interfere with that guaranteed right. Not to interfere with it by trying to extend your jurisdiction where it should not go. And not to interfere with the things that permit the fish to reproduce themselves. Remember I started this lecture with, the, the, with a, a very plain idea. Right? The very plain idea is that rights are not abstract. Rights are not abstract. We all have the right to worship as we like. But that's not an abstract right either. Right? It's not abstract because the free exercise clause and the establishment clause 
say that it's not. And it can only be expressed with the possible exception of tribal religions uh, in action. So the, the environmental claim that was made by the tribes was, is not an attempt to extend the treaty the way the state was arguing. Rather, it's an attempt to understand the treaty in the context of the continued growth of the Pacific Northwest. The continued stresses that that growth puts on the resources of the Pacific Northwest. And how you manage and how you balance those stressors against those rights that were guaranteed to the tribe under the treaty before the railroad went up to Tacoma and permitted people to move to the Pacific Northwest in great numbers. Before airplanes and interstate highways brought people from the, from the east here. Before the needs for water and energy caused dams to be created. Those rights pre-existed that. And what you have to understand is what are the material conditions given the place we are now, the situation we exist in now, what are the material conditions that give reality to those rights? Because if there is no reality to those rights, they are not rights at all. They're not rights at all. And so, rather than being a portable environmental argument that the tribe will be able to, to use against the state as it needs be, uh, it's an argument that the court declined to, to, to say explicitly what it is, but it did say what it could say and what it needed to say, which is, you bring us the concrete circumstances. You show us the net effect, and then we'll interpret that against the obligations that the treaty creates. But at root is that right to take fish. And that's going to be the lodestar against which we're going to assess the things the state does. So this could have been just an exercise, I suppose, in, in, in treaty interpretation. But there are so many more people in this room, I can tell you, who are better at it than I. Um, I can see them, so I'm a little hesitant to say anything. But I, I can tell you what it is and what it's useful for is to understand how you articulate what the obligations of one sovereign is to another, how you put in a federal system the tripartite structure that's created with the tribes as sovereigns, how you bring the obligations that were created in the 19th century up to date with the circumstances of the 21st century, and how you do not use language that guarantees a particular right as a way to eliminate or circumscribe that right, and that you remain committed to the idea that a right that is incapable of being exercised isn't a right at all. Thank you. questions uh, <laughs> you, you, you might have. Um, I could have talked a lot longer, but you know, it's late already. Um, so, uh, question. Yes, ma'am. Hello, Professor. Um, thank you so much for being here. I'm Andrea Rogers. My dad's Professor Bill Rogers. I've heard of him. Yes. <laughs> Nothing but the best. Um, the rumor on the street from the lawyers mm -hmm. in the Culbert's case is that um, they think they got Gorsuch um, on their side in, when they went to the Supreme Court. Um, what do you think about that? And what are your thoughts generally on Justice Gorsuch and uh, particularly uh, his feelings on the Indian Trust Doctrine? Uh, I'd like to know what they meant when they said they got Gorsuch. They think they have his vote. 
Well, you know, the, he... Um, because, because they were convinced they couldn't get Ginsburg. Hmm. Well, I, will, I, will, I, I, don't, I, I don't know how to assess that. I hope they're right. Yeah. I hope they're right. Uh, you know, um, I, I love the notorious RBG, <laughs> but she is not good on Indian yeah. stuff. She is not good on Indian stuff. Um, but that's, and the problem is that she understands Indian law as a subspecies of, of discrimination law. And if you go down that path, you've stepped off the trail with your first step. Uh, and you know, it's hard to get back on the trail. I don't know how many of you ever taken a wrong turn off the trail, but you know, each step you take takes you farther away from where you should be going. <laughs> Some of you I know have been there. <laughs> but, uh, and I'm afraid that might be true. But you know, Gorsuch is a Westerner. Um, you know, uh, O'Connor, I think, uh, was better too. And I think probably growing up in the West, uh, gives them a different kind of appreciation. I don't, you know, I, 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 I have no clue whether it's true or not. I fervently hope that it is. I fervently hope that it is. Um, but I have no, no way to as assess that. You know, I haven't gone through his, his and some, of, some of you here must have, gone through his work, no. his, 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 his lower court opinions on Indian law. So who's going to volunteer yeah, to do that? There's articles on that. I mean, he has more experience probably yeah. than any other justice in coming out of the Tenth Circuit. Yeah. He's obviously going to have a lot well, of cases. Well, the Tenth and the Tenth Circuit, you know, has a, there's this one ruling which uh, I got my students to write a um, uh, to turn into an executive order and submit to the Obama White House, you know, trying to get him to uh, to adopt it. Um, the silence was profound. <laughs> uh, uh, but but, but the, 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 there's a Tenth Circuit opinion, I'm, I'm blanking on the name now, which suggests that in, in, in administrative proceedings, the canons that apply in, in analyzing uh, uh, leg legislation ought to be applied when there's when tribes are involved in administrative proceedings as well. And so we, what we wanted to do was to get the president to issue an executive order declaring that the agencies have to apply uh, the, the canons of construction under Indian law generally in administrative proceedings, which would then produce a big, great body of law to play with. Sorry. Matt, before you go to that, could you explain, because I don't know that everyone in the room understands the procedural posture of the case, how it is that we're guessing about whether or not Gorsuch was... Uh, because it was... It was yeah. Uh, it, it was uh, uh, Kennedy uh, recused himself because he was on the lower uh, court ruling, um, and so it was an evenly divided court, and so the so the the uh, the district court, I mean the appellate, uh, Ninth Circuit's opinion was uh, was upheld. So that's you know so whether we don't know we don't know exactly if the Supreme Court had decided it, how how it would go, uh, and I can tell you while I I. You committed to the argument I made tonight. Uh, I'm not completely certain the Supreme Court would be committed to the argument I made tonight. <laughs> it is right, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I'm still not persuaded that they would buy it necessarily. Yes, sir. Uh, when the uh, when uh, Trump came down to this pick, there were three finalists I think for the seat that Gorsuch got, and uh, National Congress of American Indians analyzed. Uh, Gorsuch's record in the Tenth Circuit and said it wasn't bad on Indian law cases. Typically, diminishment cases, mm -hmm. there are a number of them from Utah and some other cases in the Tenth Circuit. And uh, they, they supported it and actually wrote to uh, the Senate and said, uh, he's our guy if you care about tribal rights. Gorsuch is the one we want uh, from our perspective. And he ended up uh, getting the slot. Mm -hmm. I was at the oral argument where it's a tribal uh, Indian Supreme Court case. And uh, Gorsuch, uh, Gorsuch's questioning of the uh, David and I were just talking about it. his questioning of the Washington Attorney General was tough, right out of the box. Okay. And uh, Washington argued that contemporary circumstances could modify the treaty right. And of course, they said, how can that be? These are 19th century agreements that are set in stone, and what's the basis for that? Yep. And so I counted it as a vote for the tribes. Good. Well, that, I mean, that, that, that's great because, you know, I mean, the, you know, especially since you told me that he's good on the, the reservation of measurement. Uh, 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 cases because an argument like you know present circumstances you know 
you know, have, have, have a substantive effect, right? It is, is, a, is a line we've heard in the reservation diminishment cases, much to our, you know, dismay, right? So, so the idea that that, that, that would be, that there'd be pushback from the bench on that kind of claim is actually really great. Yes, sir. For what it's worth, he also hired the first Native American woman in Ansel Walker. Praise God. Of course. Who is that? For what it's worth. Well, you know, hey, look, I've, I've only placed a few students as, as clerks in the Supreme Court. Uh, and the, uh, my instruction to them is you have one job. And that job is to teach your justice something about Indian law. <laughs> I said, I don't care what else you do, <laughs> but they better they better get better at Indian law than, than most of them have been. So maybe this will maybe you know maybe will have some effect. Uh, we can only hope. Who who is it? You know? No. Yes, sir. Well, um, you talked about Washington versus UF. What, can we talk a little bit, both politically, and legally, and strategically, about fishing rights after this case? What's next? What could be next? And are we going to lose it all? Um, give me your scenario for losing it all. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I, 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 I I suppose, I mean, the, the language that I quoted you, the, you know, the, the tribe searching for a portable uh, environmental claim, but that comes from the, the, the Washington Attorney General, right, uh, which is a, um, you can almost hear the, the contempt dripping from, from that phrase, right, uh, because they think, you know, uh, I don't know what they think, but I think they think, they think uh, uh, I I Indians uh, 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 don't also live in the 21st century. I have no idea what they're, they're thinking. But uh, my view is that uh, unless the, the Congress, uh, uh, with the, any litigation, there, there's two things that are happening right now, right? And you, you know better than I, but the, the tribe is able to participate in the administrative processes uh, with, the, with the state, right? And so the, 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 the state, they're in actually, I think, a relatively good negotiating position with the, with the state now. And so accommodations can be made with Washington to uh, help uh, uh, reduce the number of, uh, of controversies. So I think that's a, a good thing. Um, uh, and the... If that's true, then the Stevens Treaties, at least for the tribes that are participating in that process in Washington, uh, uh, don't, I, I think that, that a comp the tribes and the state will be able to reach some accommodations to preserve uh, the treaty rights. Uh, you know, it's, I don't, and I don't think the legislature will intervene, the federal, the Congress, Will intervene to to act, uh, and if it litigates, if the litigation goes up, and of course such is in fact a voice that will be listened to uh, in the court, um, <coughs> then I actually it can be relatively sanguine. Uh, although you know, I mean, it's been they've been litigating this case for what a hundred and how many years? Just this issue's been in the University of Washington since yeah. 1970. Yeah, but, the, but the, the, the whole litigation's gone on for about 100 years, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah Wyandens was the first. Yeah, Wyandens was the first, yeah. Uh, and, and, then, and then, you know, the state of Washington immediately, essentially, immediately acted as though Wyandens didn't really matter, right? Uh, and so you look at the state court uh, opinions that ultimately got challenged, and uh, that's why I said, you know, extension of state jurisdiction Right, is as pernicious as, or even more pernicious than people showing up with baseball bats and guns. My, my, my question goes beyond that. After culverts, let's say we talk about a state dam, uh, let's talk about different administration and the 
for a court. This sort of, I think Colbert's was a tactically or strategically very good target um, for uh, emphasizing or, or litigating the environmental right uh, under Stevens' treaties. Um, I just wonder, and I, I realize it's all speculation, you know, Colbert's is just the beginning of the game uh, in terms of preserving the fish. Right. No, I, I and I, rec I mean, I think culverts were obviously strategically chosen, uh, and and uh, you know, the you know, although I did kind of make light of it, the argument they made in relation to the federal funding and the federal specifications of the culverts is not is not a simple argument to, to knock down. Uh, um, whether the uh, there are other other uses of environmental claims. Uh, you know, I would I would want to be inside talking to the tribes about that uh, rather than speculate on what they they could be. Uh, um, tribes have very good lawyers, uh, and the uh, this I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this I think creates the circumstances for a conversation to occur between the state and the tribes, which is where I think it'll go in the short. Or short and intermediate run, it, it, which is uh, a kind of more cooperation rather than just litigation. If uh, if uh, you know you get a governor or an attorney general who's you know hell bent on on expanding state jurisdiction at the expense of tribes, and it's, you know it could be a different story. But but that's uh, that's an expensive expensive and politically and economically expensive proposition. So, so I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, in Indian law, it's always difficult to predict what the court's going to do, just because there's so many variables, right? I mean, one of the the things that uh, that uh, Professor Wood remembers this, I'm sure. We were canoeing on the Deschutes. And, uh, and I said, you know, the problem with the, the, the trust duty is that it's, it's not understood correctly. And she said, well, you know, what do you mean? Why <laughs> <laughs> well, she had to have the paddle in the water, she could get on the head with it. <laughs> and I said, well, properly understood, right, the trust duty ought to be a limitation on the legislative power of the federal government, not just the administrative, the, the, the executive power. Because if the plenary power is a real thing, then the trust duty's gotta be the thing that modifies the plenary, excise the plenary power. Otherwise, you're just, you know, barking. You know, when you say trust, you should just bark. <laughs> uh, uh, and I still believe that. The court, of course, no, no court has held that, I will say. But I think, you know, it, 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 it from a political theory perspective and from the perspective of justice, I think it makes sense. Uh, but here we're talking about law. Okay. <laughs> yes? So this is, um, well, first of all, that was just a phenomenal lecture. Oh. And I'm, I'm so grateful for your remarks on so many levels. I mean, it was not just a, um, a commentary on this amazing case, but I think on the premise of our Constitution. And it has all sorts of applications to the first case we talked about, the Juliana versus United States case, um, the material conditions of our other liberties. So this is a more focused question, but may allow you the opportunity to fuse the two. <laughs> and that is, um, I've always felt one of the tragedies in the um, treaty rights history was that when people were in court fighting over the number of fish, the environment was collapsing around and yet it wasn't really apparent. And so the law always comes a bit too late. Well now, um, although the culverts was a victory, of course now um, the fish are assessed, the, the thrust of the fish fell in four categories till recently. The four H's, habitat, harvest, hatchery, and hydro. Now yeah, there's a fifth H, heat. So now with the climate crisis um, threatening to collapse virtually ecosystems as a whole, 
And now the federal policy, I'm not so worried about the state policies in that regard yet, but the federal fossil fuel policies. Um, how do the tribes begin to navigate a situation where they've got a great treaty rights victory, they've got a federal government pursuing a fossil fuel policy that is near, almost taking us off the planet cliff and will do so. They're looking at the Columbia River turning into a bass fishery. Um, and the ESA litigation under the Endangered Species Act, which has gone on for 20 years, has maybe sustained um, some sort of remnant of fish, but not permanent. How do you, how do we think about this context ahead in the terms of material conditions, conditions essential for the trees? Well, you know, I mean, so the first thing I think about, of course, are, are um, uh, coastal tribes that rely on, on shellfish fisheries. Um, because of the you know the increasing acidification of the ocean as well as the heat, right, it has meant a collapse of, of some of those the shellfish uh, fisheries. Uh, the treaty rights that they have are tied to those fisheries, right? And so, what there's got to be some way, right, to protect the the subject matter of the treaty. Right, um, it could be you know climate litigation. There's no tribe I think has undertaken that, uh, uh, but it certainly is not crazy. I think to s suggest that that uh, in dealing with with climate uh, regulation, the federal government has to take into account its impact on its its, its trust duty impact. On tribal resources, and and coastal fisheries are the place where it's going to be impacted most quickly. In fact, we're seeing it, you know, today. So, uh, um, and I, I th that argument ought to be made probably politically first. Uh, um, but but I, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, it's uh, 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 it it does. Um, it changes the, the equation in really dramatic ways, and not just for coastal uh, tribes, but for uh, you know for all all tribes and the resource all tribes and the resources the tribes depend on. So that's uh, uh, you know it's it's um, but it is it is the issue around which every other issue is going to pivot, unfortunately. You know, I spend most of my time, I split my time between Austin, Texas, and, uh, and Ithaca, New York. Um, you know, they're predicting that Austin will be uninhabitable in, in 35 years, right, from the heat. I mean, it's, it's pretty close to uninhabitable in Austin anyway, but, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, right? Uh, and they give Mexico City 25 years, right, before Mexico City is uninhabitable because of the heat. Right, uh, those are real problems. Those are real problems, right? Uh, and they're causing, and most of you are probably unaware, they're causing weather disruptions already. So that uh, people in Austin have to uh, boil their water for the next two weeks um, because of the flooding in Central Texas. I mean, you turn on the tap and it's like chocolate milk. Right? Uh, uh, and and it's a it's a wrong time of the year for that flooding to be happening, actually. So, so these are real, real issues um, uh, in, in, you know, in central to New York. I mean, it's the same temperature in Ithaca as it is here right now, which it, I hesitate to say it shouldn't be. <laughs> uh, it should actually be fall, uh, real fall. It should be here too. It oh, well, <laughs> should be real fall up there. Um, uh, you know, now, you know, I have a friend of mine who does. Uh, What's called climate smart agriculture. I mean, he's a he's a food scientist uh, and a soil scientist, uh, and uh, you know he's he's making a lot of money teaching how farmers how to adapt. But you can only adapt <coughs> so much. So I don't know. But yes, your the short long answer to your question is exactly you're exactly right. You know. uh, 
which tribe will do it is the question. Yeah, yeah. Somebody else had a question. Here. Yeah, I'm wondering if what underlies all this is is the quality and the quantity of water, which is not just a tribal issue, it's an issue for all of us. And we really have um, the administrative and other legal tools to deal with water quality and quantity. So should we maybe take it more from that perspective and all of us have a foreign in that boat? Yeah, I mean, no, I think, I mean, I don't know if it's just water, uh, you know, it, I, I, I'm living, I've spent half my year in, in a state that has 2% of the world's fresh water, right? Uh, which is New York State. Uh, uh, so water up there is not really, people don't think of it as an issue, but in fact it is up there too. Uh, uh, um, so I think managing the water resource in a better way would obviously be useful, but obviously helps species, for sure. I mean, I, we could talk about the climate, you know, Klamath Wars, which are all about water, right? Uh, you know, uh, really just about water, uh, um, uh, and have present different kinds of issues than the, the, the Washington State lit litigation. Uh, but you know, I think you're right. I, you know, I think I think we need to be uh, sensitive to to, to water. I, I, when I was on the faculty of the University of Texas. I started teaching water law, right? Just because no one was teaching water law, and I'm thinking, look around, guys. <laughs> Somebody, you know, the limiting factor in Texas growth is not going to be energy, right? Since they get about 30 percent of their energy from wind already, right? It's going to be water, but people acted like, like people act everywhere, right? <laughs> like, uh, you know, I mean, I. It, I agree with you, and I think that more of us need to appreciate how close it is to an honest to God miracle that none of us ever, you know, give thanks when we walk up and turn on a faucet and potable water comes out. I mean, that's as close to a miracle as I experience every day. Right? A lot of people in the world can't do that. Right? It's an engineering miracle. Right? But it's a commitment to each other right? that makes that miracle happen. And we shouldn't, and I think your point is that we shouldn't take it for granted, and that a lot of other resource issues hinge on how we deal with that issue, and I, I completely agree with you. Somebody other hand. Yes, here, here. Um, I just want to first say thank you for coming. Oh, okay. um, You're welcome. It's always fun to come to Oregon, I have to say. It's really wonderful to have you here. Um, and actually, that was a good segue into the question that I was going to ask, because I was thinking about um, water rights settlements as an, like, another option besides litigation for tribes to assert treaty rights or um, winter's rights. And so I'm curious what you think about alternatives to litigation for pursuing um, like more sovereignty and advancing these rights that are maybe not enumerated in the treaties. Because to me, it seems like within this premise that you know the rights are not abstract and we need to have good facts mm -hmm. to make the rights. Like bad facts make bad law, and so I'm sort of trying to think about alternate ways to approach these issues yeah. outside of litigation. No, I mean I think you know uh, you know the complex uh, settlement agreements of the West that do involve the United States acting as trustee for the tribe uh, are in fact a good way to go, provided they actually do act. As uh, an honest trustee for the tribes, mm -hmm. um, uh, and if we could be guaranteed that, uh, then you could have the kind of three-cornered or four-cornered, however many parties are involved, you know, uh, water adjudications. Uh, how many of them are outstanding? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Forty-four. Forty-four. Completed. I don't know how many beyond that are still. Yeah, I don't know. You know, but that, that for some, some, I don't know, any students here that want to take up that project? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> would be a great project because, you know, the, the question would be how many, you know, how many settlements are outstanding? What are the, what's the parameters of the, of the dispute? Uh, where, where do tribes factor this? What treaties 
exist that give the tribes a, a, a purchase? Uh, how are we going to interpret that in light of the uh, competing demands? I mean, you know, when you think about water in the West, right? The, 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 the Detroit River is 10 times the volume of the Colorado, okay? And people think of the Colorado as a big river, right? Uh, I mean, the, the West does not have a lot of water. Right? It has an ever-increasing population, right? The, the fastest growing part of North America is the American Southwest and, and the Mexican Northwest, which is also the driest part of the continent, mm -hmm. right? So water issues, you know, and there, there were people who were there before, the people who were moving there, just FYI. Uh, um, um, so the water issues are going to be uh, intense, and, and uh, something other than litigation actually is preferable for resolving these disputes, I think. So uh, I, you know, I'd like to know, I don't, I don't have at the top of my head what disputes are outstanding and what the treaty implications are for the tribes in those, but it'd be a useful project. Just saying. So I we think go? we have time for one, one more question. question, right? Yeah. One more? Okay. And then I will close it. Okay. So here, here. You guys want to wrestle? <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe we can both make our questions. You both <laughs> ask your question, and I'll, then I'll, I'll, I'll answer them privately. <laughs> <Yeah. you. laughs> um, well, I wanted to just thank you for the framing that you offered at the top of your remarks. Mm -hmm sort of uh, bridging what is often presented as a dichotomy between rapid emissions reduction and just transition. And that's a space that I work in a lot, and the fracture often um, mirrors race and class. So you have racial justice and environmental justice organizations standing very firm in a just transition politic, and you have uh, sort of more science discourse, climate policy organizations who are um, saying, well, we don't have time for that. The Arctic is melting. We need the most rapid emissions reduction possible, and we'll figure out the rest of it later. And marginalized peoples are wary of that kind of a discourse um, looking at history. So I really appreciate the framing that you offered, and I just wanted to encourage or or. <laughs> <laughs> poke at that a little bit more, mm -hmm. and that discussion of um, how this dichotomy is false and that no rights can be manifest uh, without a stable climate system, but there's also this uh, urgent need for equity in our approaches to climate mitigation adaptation, so that was my question and comment. Okay, well, well I, we can talk afterwards, but... Uh... You know, a lot of people think that Occupy, remember Occupy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good, so we remember it, right? <laughs> was, 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 you know, was basically a flash in the pan. But what it did was to put economic inequality back on the agenda where it needs to be. So I'll talk to you afterwards. You question then. Um, I'm from the Salish Kootenai and Ponderi tribes in the Flathead Nation, as it's known in modern times. And we, we have the Hellgate Treaty of 1855, which is a Stevens Treaty. Mm -hmm. And, and you have a dam. Pardon me? And you yeah, we're the only tribe that owns and operates major hydroelectric facilities. It's not a good thing, I think. But, uh, I, I, I was thinking, you know, why, why isn't Hoover Dam the, the model, right, for selling alternative energy? given that you have a, a battery there. Um, I, I don't I'm just know. An idea. I understand what you're saying. <laughs> I don't know. There's a, my, my question is more um, when you look at how the United States Fish and Wildlife Service is shutting the FOIAs and the Endangered Species Act. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about very simply is in a big picture, if we look at the uh, Keystone species, the grizzly bear, you know, the last wild, sacred, roaming bison, the wolves, um, grizzly bear lived from Glacier to Yellowstone. My tribe claimed all of that territory it was our original territory, it was our treaty territory. Um, we, there's something that's missing here with, I guess my comment, it's a question that take longer. Um, children carry reservation. In our spirituality, which we call a religion, we think of a sacred landscape. 
and we can't, uh, you know, at the headwaters of the, you know, the Space Region Water to the International Peace Park crown of the continent, um, those waters make the Missouri River, they make the Columbia River. We, we can't live without without it, and we can't, uh, it's a, it's not a, it's a bad time to look at, well, um, some of the last places where these capstone species are making it, because we're there trying to ensure that. If you look to the federal government uh, right now, <coughs> it's not good. However, um, you know, I spoke with my tribe. This 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 case is very promising because the bison should we should mm -hmm. our, our treaty says we can harvest bison, and all, you know, all usual custom places. Um, what's missing here is the, ch the children, which is interesting. Um, we've got to educate the children about the things uh, because. At some point in time, they'll enforce our long-standing laws, which were, you know, to to respect nature. I thought you did a nice job of putting it in the framework of the rights of the Constitution, which is a dream that we all hope to uphold, you know, in the fullness of time and ecologically. I, I mean, I thank you. I mean, I, I, I agree with you. And we can close now, but but. That's why the, the you know the, the it's a limited opinion, right? That the the case that that worried troubles my sleep, right? Is the uh, the constitutional challenge to the Indian Child Welfare Act, right? The, the what, Texas, Louisiana, there are four states: Oklahoma, another state, just one, right? Uh, because what it, they, it and declared the ICWA unconstitutional, right? As a as a improper racial uh, category, right? And in my view, the real the target's not ICWA in those states. The target of those states is is the political existence of tribes as nations. Because if you eliminate that and treat treat it as if it's a racial issue, then be, then tribe can come unconstitutional, right? And 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 that troubles my sleep. That, that troubles my sleep because it's the the, 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 the value of treaties, all treaties, the value of treaties is the recognition that this political body is negotiating with that political body, right? And we're negotiating like this, right? That's, what, that's where treaties are valuable, right? And we need to, my view is we need to fight for that vision with all our might. On that note, please join me.